Welcome to Jesus Changes Everything, a daily podcast dedicated to providing a fresh look at the ancient and glorious truth that Jesus not only reigns, but is busy about the business of bringing all things under subjection, that celebrates the wonder and the glory that he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. We come now to part five of our ongoing series on the parables of Jesus. And we come today uh, to one of the shortest parables uh, among the parables of Jesus. This particular parable shows up for us in both Matthew 13, which we've been sort of working our way through, as well as Luke 13. And it reads this way, the kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all through the dough. That's it. That's the whole parable. It's interesting that after this parable is told, the disciples come again and ask Jesus to explain his parables, but not specifically this one. So one might argue that this is pretty uh, simple and What I'm going to give you are some pretty simple uh, truths that we can glean from this, but that that they're simple doesn't mean that they are unimportant. Let's start with this one that harkens back to the parable of the mustard seed, and that's this. The kingdom of God starts small, but it will spread and increase, just like that mustard seed became so large that the birds of the air made their nests in it. So yeast is this little tiny stuff, and only a little bit of it is needed, but eventually it spreads throughout all the dough. This is part of the reason why we're called to be optimistic and called not to despise the day of small beginnings. Think about this again. The gospel began with 12 men in the backwater of backwaters, but it has spread throughout all the world. Now, the second point is like unto the first. Yes, the yeast is small, but secondly, it also exerts its power, does its job from the inside more than the outside. It does not say that the kingdom of heaven is like a woman who takes yeast or leaven and imposes it on top of the dough. No, it gets worked into the dough. Now it does have consequences that follow out of that, that are visible and known and seen, but it begins internally, inside of us. And we need to remember that. One of the things, you know, I, I reject as unbiblical that eschatology, that view of the end times that looks at our efforts here on earth as polishing the brass on a sinking ship. I believe the parable of the mustard seed teaches that the kingdom of God's going to grow. It's going to expand. I think there's all sorts of texts like this throughout the scripture. So I have an optimistic view of the future. That said, many evangelical Christians who share my optimism make the mistake of thinking that the kingdom will come through the imposition of political power. If we were committed to the idea that our, in a sense, culture war, our uh, antithesis, the seed of the woman against the seed of the serpent, that war is real. We need to understand that. But we also need to understand that the enemy territory is inside each of us, in our hearts and in our minds. And so we need to get this leaven inside us in order to change us. 
were so zealous to go out and change the world that the world ends up changing us. I once heard this expression about the optimistic evangelists of music, that the world is full of Christians who went to change the world, went to Nashville in order to change the world, only to end up having the world change them. It's true of all of us. We need to understand that we need to change. I I am reminded of uh, the great response to uh, a newspaper uh, article back in the late 1900s or early uh, uh, no late uh, 1800s or early 1900s where a newspaper in London asked the question, what's wrong with the world? And G.K. Chesterton responded. He sent a letter to the newspaper. Dear sirs, you asked what's wrong with the world. I am. Sincerely, G.K. Chesterton. We're what's wrong with the world. We need this leaven. And we need, as we grow in grace, as we become more like what we're supposed to be, as we become the body of Christ, which is also the bread of Christ, as those things happen, we're changed. We grow. We progress. We have every reason to be confident that God is at work in us. In fact, his promise is that he who began a good work in us will be faithful to carry it through to the day of Christ Jesus. There are deep challenges to being the chief cook and bottle washer. That is, while producing this podcast, uh, is a joy to me. There are challenges that I face, technical difficulties that are over my head. Uh, I want to do this, but I don't know how. I want to do that, but I don't have the resources. But there's also a benefit of being not a giant organization. And one of those benefits is I get to make the decisions. We come today to a Curating Your Book Library segment, and I have determined today to not cover a book in the Curating Your Book Library segment to perhaps once. We'll have to see whether we do it again in the future, but at least for today, we're going to uh, extend or expand what it is we're covering in this segment Because I'd like to cover, not a book, but a record. Now, I'm old enough to remember when records were records. I'm old enough to remember going to the 5 and 10 and flipping through 45s. And then when I got a little older, flipping through the uh, long-playing records. The record I'd like to speak to you about today is not something I have on vinyl or on CD, but something I've downloaded because it was released in 2015, released by my friend Andrew Peterson. Those of you who have been listening a long time, you may recall that uh, our bumper music used to be uh, made out of one of the songs from this particular record, The Dark Before the Dawn. Well, this record, The Burning Edge of Dawn, means a great deal to me as well as a great deal to my wife, Lisa. This was a part of our lives when God was drawing our lives together. Lisa was gracious enough to share some music that meant a lot to her, and I was ungracious enough to not be very appreciative and tell you, yeah, that's really not my style. Uh, But here, try this. And I sent her some Andrew Peterson, and uh, that's how we uh, got together on the Andrew Peterson train. But this particular album, The Burning Edge of Dawn, just seemed like it was, in God's good hands, uh, the outpouring 
of God's plan for our lives. There were things, there were things in the lyrics that just struck us right where we were. Uh, it is a profoundly beautiful record. Andrew Peterson is immeasurably gifted as a songwriter, as uh, a writer myself, not a writer of music, but a writer of words. I love listening to him because of his economy of words. It is poetry. It is uh, intense. And then when that's coming out, talking about uh, Lisa and I, it's just all that much more beautiful. One of those places uh, that this was evident is one of the songs called My One Safe Place. And it is a ode to the grace of God and our security in him because of Jesus. But it's also a reminder of our calling as husbands and wives to be a safe place, to be a place of encouragement. You know, no one knows me better than Lisa. And so when I do badly, uh, she knows it and when, and it just kills me. But if I pretend to be something that I'm not, then I'm disconnected from her. So I need her to be my one safe place. She needs me to be her one safe place. But no song was more powerful in our lives together than the last song on the record called The Sower's Song. Andrew does a a magnificent job, not only of uh, writing lyrics, but of weaving into his lyrics God's own lyrics. And there is this part of the song where he begins to recite the promises of God from the book of Isaiah with the music playing in the background, and it's just absolutely touching. Another gift that Andrew has is working with others. I don't know who this is. Actually, it may very well be. No, no, I don't know who this is. Uh, There is a background singer in that particular song that calls us to peace and calls us to rest. And it just reminds me of uh, the profoundly uh, soothing and restful voice of my own precious wife. Now, one thing's going to stay the same in this curating your book library segment that actually doesn't look at a book, but at a record. And that's this. I want to know your thoughts. If you have this record, and again, pardon my uh, anachronistic way of referring to it. If you downloaded uh, this particular project of Andrews or any of them, I'd love to hear uh, your own thoughts. How it's uh, if 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 his music has been a blessing to you as it has to me and to Lisa. Uh, if you haven't yet heard it, I really would encourage you to go uh, download it and take a listen. There are lots of other wonderful Andrew Peterson uh, records out there. I have a quite extensive list of them. So please check it out and let us know what you think. Andrew Peterson, The Burning Edge of Dawn. I don't remember what we were talking about. I don't remember why we were talking about it. But I do remember what he didn't remember. The he of whom I speak was my father, and he and I were engaged in a conversation about something. I don't know what. And it was my hope to make a point in this conversation. It may have been an argument of some kind or disagreement. may not have been. But I wanted to make a point that I thought would be an encouraging point for him, or at least a point where I could acknowledge my own weaknesses And I said to him, do you remember that time? Well, before I go on, let me tell you what that time was. We were in a moment of crisis at Ligonier Ministries, not brought on by any sort of scandal or anything. And this was 
now more than 20 years ago, more than like, like more than 25 years ago. And uh, I was in a meeting with uh, all the team members that I was a part of in the subsection of Ligonier that I worked for, the education department. My immediate boss was there, uh, people who were others who were above me and people who were on par with me. I was pretty low in the totem pole at this point. Uh, and my father was there. And in the course of this conversation, when we're trying to solve some sort of problem, this crisis... Uh, my father makes some sort of suggestion. I don't know what it was. I didn't, did I mention this meeting was in his living room, which is very unusual? He invited all these uh, staff people over to the house. We're in his living room. We're having this conversation. He makes this suggestion. And I had a thought on the suggestion that I decided to share. This was my thought. And this is what I said to my father the chairman of the board of Ligonier Ministries, my boss's boss, I said to him, are you out of your mind? In that conversation years later, I said, do you remember that meeting? And when I said that, my dad said, no. No. Now, you might think that I would be frustrated because I needed him to remember that story in order to make whatever point it was I wanted to make. But I, I didn't have time to be frustrated because I was just so taken aback by my father's character. No. Instantly in my mind, I thought one of two things has to be true. Either he is a good enough man that he has actually forgotten this horrible sin that I committed against him. And I had very quickly apologized, repented uh, in front of everybody that was there. And he's just forgotten it like a good man. Or he's a man good enough to lie to me about it. No, he said, I don't remember that. And even if it was a lie, what he was trying to communicate was the truth, that he was so not holding this against me that it doesn't cross his mind. He has forgotten to be upset over what I did. There's a lot of dispute out there about forgiveness, about whether or not forgiveness requires forgetting and uh, those who, in essence, quibble with God himself when he says, I will remember your sins no more. Uh, and it's certainly the case that God is omniscient and knows all things, and in that sense, never forgets anything. At the end of the day, though, this is what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is not holding something against somebody. And that's what my dad did. I got a confession to make. I, I didn't hear my dad repent very often when I was growing up. I don't think that was a strength of his. And I don't think that's good to not have that be a strength. Forgiving, on the other hand. <laughs> Man, did he know how to do that. He forgave in spades, which by the way, is probably a good sign that even if I didn't hear it, that he was a profoundly repentant man. No, I don't remember that, he said to me. And I'll never forget that. You've been listening to the Jesus Changes Everything podcast, a production of Dunamis Fellowship, the teaching outreach of Dr. R.C. Sproul Jr. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we encourage you to subscribe, which you can do at all the usual outlets, to tell your friends, and to spread the word. To learn more about the work of Dunamis Fellowship, please visit rcsprouljr.com and join us next time on Jesus Changes Everything.